Good afternoon and welcome to today's program titled, The Therapeutic Relationship, How Movement and Connection Drive Effective Therapy Results. I'm Shannon Bryce, Associate Editor of Addiction Professional Magazine. Today's program is a Foundation's Recovery Network webinar sponsored by ALIR. Thank you to our sponsor and to you and our audience for giving us your time and attention. Before we get started, I'd like to share a few housekeeping details. Each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging or enlarged and minimized by clicking the icons in the top right corner of each window. Please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. If you cannot see this area, simply click the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's slides, please click the link in the resources area in the upper right of your screen. If you have any technical issues during the program, please click the yellow help button to troubleshoot the issue. Our CE process has recently changed. To receive credit for today's program, you must click the green CE certificate widget at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. If you are watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and program evaluation form located in today's resource list and follow the instructions there. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Susan Wolfson, LCSW. Susan Wolfson is a licensed clinical social worker and certified clinical hypnotherapist with a successful psychotherapy practice in Bradenton, Florida. She received her first master's degree in psychology from Duquesne University and second master's in social work from New York University. She completed intensive study in cl clinical hypnotherapy with rapid trauma resolution at the Institute for Rapid Resolution Therapy and the Institute for Survivors of Sexual Violence. Susan has also completed the required course instruction to be a qualified supervisor in the state of Florida to supervise registered clinical social work interns for their licensure. Thank you, Susan, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, the audience is yours. Okay. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you for everybody who's listening in. I'm really excited about doing this today, so I will just get started. So... This webinar is about how movement and connection are not only indispensable in therapy, but are woven throughout the therapeutic process. We'll be looking at exactly how the work that therapists do is all about reorganizing or restructuring the mind so that it connects and responds to its environment in a valuable and beneficial way. We all know that stuff happens in life. Things happen to us which affect how our minds work, which then affects how we think, feel, and act. We usually can't do anything about the stuff that happens to us, especially when it's stuff that's happened in the past or stuff that other people are doing. But we can do something about how the mind responds to that stuff. And the way that the mind responds to the stuff is what causes us to feel whatever we're feeling. We can change our responses to what happened by changing our experiences of the events. And, as Wayne Dyer has said, when we change the way we look at things, the things we look at change. Effective therapies restore connection and clarity for the individual. So let's look a little at the notion of connection. We may understand that the brain is a social organ as it builds its structure through its interactions with others. Connections between and among neurons in the brain mirror connections between and among people. The stronger the connections are in the brain, the better we are able to establish and maintain meaningful connections with others. We therapists have an amazing and wonderful opportunity to guide our clients through this strengthening process. In doing so, we not only strengthen and clarify the, the client's thoughts, feelings, and actions, but our own 
as well. Our minds only exist because of those around us. When we look at it like this, and by the way, this notion has been researched and discussed by Dan Siegel, Louis Casolino, Alan Shore, and, and many others. But when we look at it like this, then our job as therapists is to make that responsiveness possible. And the way that we do that is by connecting with our clients and creating a meaningful experience for them, causing them to think, feel, and act with clarity. The approach I use is rapid resolution therapy, which in my experience is by far and away the quickest, most efficient, life-changing approach. So I'll be looking through the lenses of rapid resolution therapy as I present this webinar. However, what I'm intending to share with you today is that establishing and maintaining connection throughout the therapy process, as well as movement toward a desired response, is fundamental regardless of the approach used. So I'm inviting you to share this experience with me as we look at connection in therapy and movement toward the elimination of emotional disturbances. Some of you may already be familiar with neuroplasticity, but just briefly, it's the brain's ability to adapt in response to new experiences. This is a process that continues throughout the lifespan. Our brains are always, always changing as a result of our experiences. Neurogenesis is the brain's ability to generate new neural pathways, also in response to the environment. And this is something that also continues throughout life. The brain is made up of neurons, which are connected to each other through synapses. Experiences that we have either strengthen those neural connections or create new ones. Stimulation, whether in work or play, creates change in the brain's adaptation and response to others. Conversely, without stimulation and interactions, the neurons wither and die. Louis Casolino said that or spoke of that in his book, um, The Neuroscience of Human Relationships, which and at the end I'll have a little um, a slide with some references, some reading materials for you. Um, another really good article is called Wired to Connect, Neuroscience, Relationships, and Therapy. Again, I'll have that later on for you. Um, and speaking of reading material, the book, The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge is really excellent at showing how neuroplasticity and neurogenesis happen. The brain maps its environment. This book is loaded with examples of how the brain changes on its own in response to its environment. One that I found really interesting was an experiment done with monkeys or maybe chimpanzees. I don't, I'm not sure. But anyway, the geographical placement of the motor neurons in the brain mirrors the geographical placement of the parts of the body so that the neuron which controls the movement of the right forefinger is next to the neuron that controls the movement of the right middle finger. And an experiment was done on, mon on these monkeys where they taped two fingers together and they watched how the brain changed in response to the change in the body. After about a month, these two motor neurons fused together, mirroring the two fingers that were taped together. It's a really great book, and, and like I said, I highly recommend it if you're interested 
Epigenetics is another field which is in line with the mind-body effect on one another. Epigenetics is also really interesting because it shows that even down to the cellular level, our bodies change in response to what's going on. Um, Bruce Lipton is a cellular biologist who's pioneered epigenetics. He talks of, he put a cell in a petri dish and it divided many times over. It was the same cell, just now lots of them, genetically identical. Then he divided this multitude of cells into three groups, all with a slightly different culture environment. One group formed muscles, another group formed bones, and a third group formed fat cells. What changed? They were genetically identical. What changed was the environment. The cells' responses changed as the environment changed. And their responses to their environment is what caused them to develop either bone, muscle, or fat tissue. This is interesting. One, because it's in direct contrast to a prevailing belief that genes determine disease, but two, because it shows how one's genetic makeup is like a blueprint. It means nothing without an environment to respond to. In another article that I came across recently, a study was done with rhesus monkeys who had a particular gene for extreme aggression. When these monkeys were raised by very calm, gentle mothers, their behavior was not at all aggressive. Even though the aggressive gene was still biologically active in them, their attachment to their calm mothers altered the blueprint of the aggressive gene. So the gene alone doesn't determine the individual's behavior, but only accounts for one's vulnerability to a particular environment. The meaningfulness of the connections one has with others or the mind's response to its environment are more powerful in molding thoughts, feelings, and actions than the genetic environment alone. When we look at the clients that we see who come to us with emotional pain, we can understand that the environments have not caused the pain but rather the way that their minds have been responding to their environment has been what has caused the pain. Unlike Bruce Lipton's experiment where he actually changed the environment, we as therapists change the mind's response to that environment. And in doing so, we change the client's experience of the event. So let me go ahead and apply what's known from the research and from our own experiences to show how we can best help our clients to move out of the pain by being mindful or aware of their connections. Let's start with the assumption that people come to therapy with emotional pain and they've been feeling stuck in this pain. Very often, the more they try to free themselves, the more stuck they get. The goal of therapy then is the elimination of that pain and the elimination of the stuckness. When we take away pain, we get connection. And when we take away stuckness, we get movement. That's key, so I'll repeat it. When we take away pain, we get connection. And when we take away stuckness, we get movement. The most effective way I have found in doing that is to intend the outcome, whether it's focus or happiness or calmness, whatever it is, and get that client's agreement on that intention. By the client agreeing with that intention or that goal, there is an automatic connection 
between you and the client. You're both on the same page. You share the same intention and, in doing so, share the same vision and energy. You and the client are connected. Furthermore, as the client is looking towards what is intended, his or her brain is restructuring and rewiring in response to that goal, setting itself up to respond to it even more quickly and powerfully. So already there's movement, movement toward the desired response. The therapist then speaks to the client using both words as well as stories, symbols, and metaphors, which is what appeals to the deeper subconscious part of the mind, the part that that part understands. In order to have the client's mind moving and responding even more powerfully toward the intention, what we want is for the client to get it on that deeper level, that those previous painful thoughts or beliefs no longer make any sense. Once they get it, they get it, and they've got it for good. It doesn't go away. Just like once people get that it's their parents who are putting money under the pillow, they never go back to believing in the tooth fairy. Thinking and feeling as they had previously is no longer useful and no longer makes any sense. The role of the therapist is extremely valuable to understand in this. And I'll get to it in a little bit. But for now, I'd just like to talk a little bit about making sense. The mind is always trying to make sense of what's going on. Always, 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 always. When we understand what's going on, both within our minds and in our environments, we feel a sense of comfort, security, predictability. There's a connection between what we experience automatically and what we understand logically. We get it. With that comfort, security, and predictability, we're better able to see, think, and feel clearly. With clarity, we act and interact in ways that are beneficial to us and to those around us. However, when the mind can't make sense of what's going on, there's a disconnect. But the mind continues to try to make sense, and try isn't a good word because it happens automatically, but the mind continues to try to make sense because that's just what it does. As an example, think of the mass shootings that have happened during the past few years. Everyone wants to know why. Reporters interview mental health professionals to find out why and how people can behave like that. Everyone says that those criminal activities just don't make any sense. And the more something doesn't make sense, the more people want to know why. They want to understand. Why do they want to understand? Because to not understand means to feel disconnected and immobile, the opposite of comfortable and secure. That sentence pretty much sums up what I'm saying in this webinar. The need to understand and to make sense of one's environment is as fundamental and automatic as the need to connect. The mind is always, always communi communicating to us as it's making sense of what's going on. And it communicates to us through emotions. It communicates very clearly. The challenge has been understanding the messages it's been sending. So just briefly, when things make sense, we connect 
and our minds communicate that with pleasant emotions. When things don't make sense, there's a disconnect, and our minds communicate that with unpleasant emotions. And anger and frustration are two perfect examples of what I'm talking about. They're two perfect examples of what happens when we try to make sense of something that doesn't make sense. We try to understand what other people are saying or doing because that's how we connect in order to feel comfortable and at peace. When another person is not making sense, the mind does what Ever it can to either one get them to make sense meaning get them to see things the way we do or two to understand where they're coming from hoping that if we can see things through their eyes then we would understand or get it or connect with them if you've ever gotten angry at someone your intent has been to get them to see things the way you do And you may yell or scream about it. You may try speaking calmly. But either way, we want the other person to connect with us. What I'm proposing is that anger is an attempt to say, hey, listen to me, understand me, see things the way I do. In other words, connect with me. And this happens all the time. If you're driving your car and someone runs a stop sign and they end up hitting your rear bumper, then you get out of the car and and the guy comes over you screaming about what a lousy driver you are. You then say, me, you're the one that ran the stop sign. And the two of you go on yelling because each of you thinks that you're right. And you want the other to agree with you that you are, in fact, right. You want the other person to connect, at least as far as that stop sign is concerned. When that fails, when the person doesn't connect with us, when they just don't get it, we get angry. Anger, as I see it, is the feeling we get when we can't get the other person to connect with us. Now, the flip side of that coin is when we try to understand the other person to connect with them by trying to see things the way they do and understand through their eyes. When we try to do that and we can't, then we get frustrated. When we try but can't make sense of what the other person is saying or how they're acting, That's very frustrating. Imagine going to a foreign country where nobody speaks English and you don't speak their language. Trying to communicate is extremely frustrating. Believe me, I've been there. Frustration, as I see it, is not being able to connect with the other person or idea or thought. So those are my definitions of anger and frustration. Both are the result of failed attempts to connect with the other person. And for the record, it doesn't even have to be with another person. Um, I remember as a kid getting angry at the metronome when I was trying to play a piece of music on my clarinet. It wasn't keeping the same beat as I was, and I was sure that I was right and it was wrong. So I got really angry at it. When I tried to follow the beat that the metronome was keeping, I got really frustrated because I couldn't. So it doesn't even have to be another person or an animal or any living being. We are constantly receiving stimulation from a variety of places. How many of us have gotten angry and frustrated at our computers or laptops? We've all become so dependent on the Internet. When our connection with it is broken, it's devastating and overwhelming.
when we look at other disturbances, we see the absence of connection and movement. More specifically, there can be no meaningful movement without connection, and there can be no meaningful connection without movement. Depression, for instance, occurs when people put effort into something where there's no response. Depression is about trying logically and consciously to connect while at the same time automatically or subconsciously being overcome with hopelessness and powerlessness. Depression is a heaviness, a feeling of being trapped by this dark cloud of weight. It's about trying so hard to see and connect beyond this cloak of darkness, but becoming exhausted by that effort. In depression, the person can't see, think, feel, or act clearly because of this covering. The cry during depression is, connect with me, please, someone, just connect, and get me out of this heaviness. We can see other disturbing emotions in the same light as failed or misdirected attempts to connect. As I mentioned, emotions communicate, and each emotion has a specific message. As I said, in anger, the message is get the other person to connect with us or thing. In frustration, the message is Connect with the other person. In depression, the cry is, please, someone help me connect. Another is guilt. Guilt is about a disconnection in the past. So the message is connect in the past. If I feel guilty, for instance, about having eaten a whole box of cookies. And then eating them was a disconnect between what I value, appreciate in myself, and my action, which was the opposite of that. In worry, worry is about a possible disconnection in the future. So the message in worry is connect in the future. If I'm worried, for instance, that I won't be able to pass an exam later in the week, then the concern is that if I don't pass, I'll feel bad. I'll feel disconnected from that reward of studying, which may be um, some certificate or a grade or whatever it is. And finally, grief. And there's there's others, too. I'm just giving you a few examples. But another one, the, the last one that I have here is grief. And in grief, the message is connect with a person who has died. In our society, the prevailing belief is that when someone dies, they're gone forever. Either they're off with the angels or they're deep in the ground, but either way, they're gone, never to return. And we're left here alone. The message of grief, then, is to connect and actually the connection in grief is very profound because our connection is with the energy or essence of the person who died not the body connection as I see it is the red thread running through all emotions the emotions simply tell us whether or not we are connected And the role of therapists is to allow for that connection. For those of us who work with trauma, we can see the disconnect very clearly. We can see that when people experience traumatic events, the experiences of those events often continue long after the events have passed. Logically and consciously, the person may know 
that those events are no longer happening, but on that deeper level, it feels like they still are. Trauma creates a disconnect between the logical, conscious part of the mind and the deeper, automatic, subconscious part of the mind where emotions lie. Trauma changes how the mind works. Judith Herman has written a lot about that. She's written seminal books on on trauma, which I did not include in my slide, and I'm sorry about that, but I encourage you to read Judith Herman. Anyway, I have up there um, some examples of how trauma changes how the mind works. Actually, what happens in trauma is that the person becomes hypnotized into thinking, feeling, and acting in response to that traumatic event. I say hypnotized because it's like they're in a trance. The little girl who is raped, or even the little boy who sees his parents divorced, two very different experiences, but they both change how the mind works. And they both result in the kids changing the way they think, feel, and act. When we look at it like this, and I do, but when we look at it like this, then what we as therapists do is de-hypnotize our clients. We get their minds back on track and working to their best advantage so that the mind sees and understands clearly. Again, to understand means to make sense of, which in turn means to connect with. In the therapeutic relationship, once there is that connection, there can be movement together toward the intention. As I said before, there can be no movement without that connection. As therapists, we are constantly challenged to connect, or some would say engage, with the client. I know that in traditional therapy, we're taught to start where the client is. Well, the client is usually in a really bad place. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in therapy. So to me, it makes more sense to have the client start where we are. Because as far as the client's problems are concerned... I would assume that the therapist is the one who is clear and therefore in a better position to help the client. Getting the client to connect to the therapist, then, is key in moving the client forward toward the desired intention. Simply by connecting, the client is on their way toward clarity. Obviously, it's much easier to get somewhere when the person is seeing it clearly than when they are clouded by any of those disturbances, whether depression, anxiety, guilt, shame, anger, grief, any of that. So how does the therapist get the client to connect with him or her? By saying what is universally appealing. For instance, the client who is feeling sad wants to feel content. The person who's feeling confused wants clarity. The person who's feeling lonely wants to connect meaningfully with others. These disturbances are all examples of the client's mind not making sense of what's going on in their world, either internally or externally. As I mentioned a little while ago, Most people haven't learned to read or understand the messages that emotions are sending. Instead, we just feel them and the mind attaches some meaning to them. Most of the clients we see who recognize that their life is not going the way they'd like it to be going have tried, sometimes for years, to feel better. However, they haven't been able to. That's why they come to us, because they've been stuck in their feeling bad or their bad feeling. We could say that the people who come to therapy have their lenses pointed in the wrong direction. They've either been looking within themselves to figure out what's wrong with them to be feeling these emotions, 
or they've been blaming others for their distress. Either way, the client's focus and awareness has been on their pain, hoping that understanding the pain will get rid of it. Focusing on the pain, however, causes the lenses to be pointed inward on the pain, causing greater disconnection, greater immobility, and greater pain. When we get those lenses pointed out, curious and interested in what's out there, namely the intention, the client is then able to see where they're going. You wouldn't want to drive a car while looking in the rearview mirror. The art of the psychotherapist in getting the client's mind responding to the desired target or goal is in saying what will appeal to all parts of the mind. And since different parts of the mind hear things differently, the therapist communicates in two different languages. The language of words for the logical conscious part of the mind and the language of metaphors and symbols for the subconscious deeper, more primitive part of the mind. Only once all parts of the mind are looking out together at the same desired end does lasting change occur. With clarity, the mind is, as Dan Siegel says, faces, flexible, adaptive, coherent, expressive, and stable. The lenses are pointed out toward what is both possible and beneficial. The intention is lit with appeal, and the mind automatically responds to that. And I'm sorry, I forgot that slide. A number of people have researched and spoken along these lines. Rudy Tanzi is a neuroscientist at Harvard, and he speaks of the brain as a verb. It's an amazing organ with hundreds of thousands of nerve cells and neural pathways which are always changing. The key power is its ability to adapt. It's a dynamic organ. Everything we do, everything we think or feel, all change the brain at all levels, at the chemical level, at the level of how neurons connect, and as discussed before, even at the genetic level. It affects how our genes are expressed. This happens throughout life, as neuroplasticity has shown us. Physical exercise has even been shown in some animal studies to help grow new nerve cells in the hippocampus, which is responsible for short-term memory. Again, the more meaningful movement in the brain, the greater the connections among the neurons and the more automatic the feelings of peace and clarity. Another neuroscientist is um, Daniel Wolpert, and he says that the only purpose of the brain is to control movement. The brain controls muscle movement, sensory feedback, our thoughts, beliefs, knowledge. We take in information from the outside, process it through our brains, and then use that to affect the world around us, which we do by connecting with it. Rick Hansen speaks of mindful attention, or what I'll call awareness, as the essence of learning. Our brains mold and shape through the mind's responses to the environment. This happens all the time, even when we're sleeping. And the more we respond to our environment with clarity and peace, the stronger the connections, both internally and externally. The stronger those connections, the easier and more automatic it becomes to connect. And the way we learn and grow is by being curious and interested. So let me just talk briefly about that. There's been a lot of research on mindfulness meditation and the positive effects of it. Mindfulness, as I see it, is a conscious awareness of what was previously not conscious. So for the purpose of this webinar, I'm using the terms mindfulness and awareness 
interchangeably. By simply being aware, when it comes to mind to do, one is being mindful. And the more one happens to be aware, the more often one finds that his or her mind is drawn towards that awareness automatically. And as this happens, the neurons in the brain are strengthening, the amygdala relaxes, there's a greater sense of peace and calm. We become aware of that feeling, that connectedness with others, with the energy that flows among all of us. We're able to see, think, feel clear, more clearly because of this movement and this responsiveness toward connection. And all we're doing is being aware of the energy. One way to do this, um, you can do this with your clients, you can do this with yourselves, that I found very helpful, is to simply to sit on the chair with your feet on the floor and with the eyes closed bring awareness towards your breathing awareness towards the darkness behind your eyelids awareness of the sensations in your fingertips awareness of the sounds in the room feeling the floor beneath you and the smell of the air that you're breathing. By bringing awareness to the sensations, you're aware of the energy both inside your body and outside your body, strengthening the connection between the two. As awareness draws in towards these movements, they magnify and intensify automatically. Awareness is connection. So awareness of these movements is connection with these movements. That was a brief mindful awareness session you can do with yourselves or with your clients. The more elaborate you are with it, or the more you expand on the awareness, maybe the hardness of the floor as it touches your feet, the slowness of your breathing, the more you do that, the deeper the awareness and the more responsive the mind The lasting benefits of awareness cannot be underestimated. Much research has been done recently by so many people that I can't even begin to mention all of them. But among them is a recent study out of UCLA, how all parts of the mind experience growth and connection as a result of awareness or mindful meditation. Other studies have shown that people who meditate score higher in both critical and abstract thinking. In a study published in May of this year in the Journal of Psychological Science, a team of researchers at UC Santa Barbara found that after a two-week mindfulness training program, a group of undergraduates showed a decrease in mind wandering, and an increase in working memory. They also performed better on the reading comprehension part of the GRE. Like I said before, however, there's, there's literally tons of articles and studies showing the positive effects of mindfulness and the lasting benefits of awareness. Of course, like I said, I, I use those terms 
interchangeably. A recent study on the brain of Einstein, for instance, um, which is another example of this, show that the corpus callosum of his brain, which is the area that connects the left and the right hemispheres, was thicker than most of ours, our regular normal people. And that there was a greater number of glial cells. Those are the stuff that surrounds the neurons in the brain. Although the thickness alone may not account for his intelligence, the greater connectivity between the two sides of the brain, the logical side and the creative side, or the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere, likely accounts for much of it. Practicing awareness probably won't result in any of us becoming an Einstein, but it will strengthen the connections between the two hemispheres of the brain and allow for greater clarity, focus, peace, and happiness automatically. Any approach to psychotherapy which aims toward a final end of clarity and peace then incorporates movement and connection throughout the process. And by being aware of the movement and connection throughout the therapeutic process, the therapist is guiding the client toward clarity and peace. The value of responding with clarity is feeling, thinking, and acting in ways that are both possible and beneficial to oneself and to others. For anyone who's interested, like I said, I've included a few of the reading resources which I've referred to in this webinar. I left a couple of them out. Another really good one is Bruce Lipton's book, um, The Biology of Belief, about epigenetics. That's really good, too. And, um, yeah, so these are really good. I encourage you to read them if you're interested. So I want to thank everyone for listening. And I encourage you to bring awareness to movement and connection in your own lives and practices. For more information on rapid resolution therapy, which is the foundation from which I practice, the contact information is up there. Thanks again to foundations and everyone listening in on this webinar. I hope you found it to be informative and beneficial. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is up there also. Otherwise, Shannon, I'm giving it back to you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Susan. That was Thank a you. fantastic presentation. We have had a number of questions come in during your presentation. However, we would also like to remind you in our audience to use that Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to continue to submit questions at any time. We'll be doing this question portion for about the next 10 minutes or so. So um, let's start with a question. Somebody wants to know, what is your view of about validating the emotions of the client. Okay. Um, in traditional therapy, we're taught to, my understanding of validate is to say, yes, you feel like that. I totally understand it. It must be terrible. I'm so sorry. And often to have the clients feel it even more. What I think it's more useful is to recognize and to acknowledge that you recognize and that you get that that's how that how they have been feeling but changing the um then quickly moving towards the intention out of that painful um emotions those painful feelings I hope that answers it. Okay, great. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Okay. Um, so 
Someone else is wondering, what suggestions do you have for working with clients who are aware of their emotions and precipitating factors but are still experience, experiencing that stuck feeling? Yeah, that's, that's a good question because that happens, like, all the time. Um, many people, like I said in, in the presentation, a lot of people, they've been trying to get out of this feeling of stuckness or emotional pain for many a long time, but they haven't been able to. Um, what we as therapists do is change their focus to, instead of being on the pain and analyzing what has gone on in their life, which I know in in general society, psychology is always said to analyze things, but um, analyzing what's been going on and how they've been feeling is like digging a hole. And when you dig a hole, you just get deeper and deeper in the hole. What we want to do is get out of that, changing the focus toward the intention and toward connection. Um, I hope I answered that one. Great. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Somebody else wanted, um, I guess, some clarification on rapid resolution therapy. They're wondering what the difference is between that and EMDR. Mm. I'm not all that familiar on EMDR, so I really can't speak to it. However, what I do know of EMDR, um, in, from, from what I know of EMDR, in rapid resolution therapy, there's no um, um, back and forth of the eyes. There's no um, listening to sounds, which I believe that's done in, in EMDR too. Um, and there's no reliving the trauma. My understanding is that in EMDR, people relive, re-experience whatever trauma they had. They do it very briefly, but then once it's done, they then they get out of it. Um, and EMDR is, has been effective, I, as far as I understand. I, like I said, I'm not a, an expert on it. In rapid resolution okay. therapy, however, people do not re-experience their traumatic event. They don't relive it. They, re, they lived it once, that was enough. They don't relive it. So, um, and they, we clear the disturbing emotions without reliving the experience. So that's probably one big difference that I can think of that's coming to mind right okay. now. Okay. Great. Thank you. We have a couple comments here about motivational interviewing, and people are saying a lot of this sounds similar to maybe practices of motivational interviewing. Someone was wondering if you incorporate motivational interviewing principles at all in your work. Um. No, because I'm not really familiar with it. I'm I'm aware of it. I, I know it's it's very useful, especially in interventions. But um, no, I don't do interventions. I don't do motivational interviewing, and I'm not I'm not familiar enough to comment on that. Other okay. Than say no. Okay. Yeah. No, that's okay. fine. Um, okay. Do you? Somebody was wondering if you know of research that supports the relationship itself as an inter- intervention for counseling? There have been lots and lots of articles written about how the therapeutic relationship is the most important part of effective therapy. Um, a lot of what has been coming out recently in terms of um, connections between people, like I was talking about, um, and that, for instance, that study that I mentioned with um, the rhesus monkeys who had the aggressive gene, who were raised by um, calm mothers, turned out not to be aggressive, even though the aggressive gene was biologically active in them, shows how the relationship with them, with their mothers, how the relationship was even stronger in terms of um, molding and shaping how they were going to be. So, um, but other than that, there's, I don't know, there's okay. stuff out there, but I can't say anything specific. Sorry. Okay, great. No, that's that's great. Um, 
another person was wondering about physical movement and wondering if that would be useful in a session um, where you're using these types of principles as well. Do you have suggestions for using physical movement or anything you can speak to about that? Physical movement is always good. Physical exercise is always good. And again, as I had mentioned in the presentation, that um, in um, um, that physical exercise was shown, at least in um, one experiment with animals, to grow new uh, nerve cells in the brain. So yes, physical movement is always good. But in terms of the therapeutic relationship itself, um, I don't incorporate physical movement in my therapy. So I can't speak to that, but I would think that absolutely in therapies that are dance therapies or movement therapies, absolutely, yes. Okay, wonderful. Another person is wondering about um, connecting to grief. How how would you suggest that a client suggests, connects to their grief or connects to that loved one that they are longing to connect with? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um it's a different way of looking at things. It's understanding everything, people, relationships, in terms of the energy that connects us. And actually that's what, well, this is good because it's a good tie-in for the the connection in the therapeutic relationship. Um, what we have with people is the experiences that we have with them the memories, the um, the experiences. And those experiences that we have with people, we have them forever. I mean, that there's, I can remember experiences I had with friends when I was a kid. I remember those experiences vividly because they were meaningful experiences. So even though I may not have been in touch with them for, I don't know, a long time, I won't say how long, um, even though I may not be in touch with them for a long time, I still have those memories and those experiences. It's similar when somebody dies. When they die and their body could no longer continue to function, that's why they died. The experiences that we had with them, we have them forever. And the essence and energy of who they are, whether it's they were loving, sweet, caring, generous, whatever, whatever it was, that's always there. So in grief, the connection is with that, that energy, that essence. Um, okay. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you. Somebody okay. asked a specific question about the study you talked about regarding the monkeys, and mm -hmm. they said, in the example regarding attaching the calm mother and altering that aggressive gene in the monkeys, what would you say regarding the fact that addiction is often biological? Um, and, and they asked, do you believe that the gene for addiction can be altered in the same way? Probably. Um, probably. As I said, the gene doesn't determine whether or not someone's going to get addicted or someone's going to be an alcoholic or someone is going to be aggressive or violent. It doesn't determine that, but it does. It, oh, it doesn't determine what the behavior is going to be. It just determines the person's vulnerability to that environment. Um, so in a, anyway, in answer to that question, yeah, probably. Okay, I don't Great. think that everybody who has... Um, a gene for addiction becomes an addict. Right. So. Exactly. Okay, well, great. That is all the time we have for questions today. We have some final instructions regarding CE credit. Please note that the CE certificate process has recently changed, so please pay attention to the following. CE Learning Systems has approved today's program for one continuing education credit. To receive your certificate of completion, you must click the green CE Certificate Widget, complete the evaluation form, and then click Submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and Program 
evaluation form located in the resources area and follow the instructions provided there. If you have any questions, please click the purple Contact Webinar Help Desk widget at the bottom of the screen. Please join us on Wednesday, November 13, 2013 at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time for another Foundations Recovery Network webinar sponsored by ALEAR. This one will be titled 12 Steps, The Sequel, and will be presented by Dr. Wendy E. Coughlin. A link will appear on your screen in a moment for you to register for that program. You can also register for that event by clicking the purple Register for the Next Foundations webinar widget at the bottom right of the screen. I want to again thank Susan Wolfson for an excellent presentation. I would also like thank to thank Alir for making today's Foundations Recovery Network program possible. Finally, thank you to you and our audience for participating today. We hope you'll join us in the future for another Addiction Professional webinar and this concludes today's presentation.